Russia just met, um, basically hit about a third of the production of the U.S., a third to a quarter of the production of U.S. in terms of total megawatt um, hours in mining uh, for oh. Bitcoin. So right now in the U.S., we've got like three to four megawatts in, in Bitcoin mining energy power. And in Russia, they've just hit me one megawatt, but there's state-sponsored state mining projects going on in in Russia to increase that capacity even further. Interesting. Okay, everyone, this is Grant, and this is the Aussie. And we don't have Jarrett today. Jarrett is already at NFT NYC getting settled in. And I can't tell if I'm jealous or not, because on one hand, I just, there's so many cool people to meet, but I think it would be pandemonium. Like, I think like, like keeping up with the Joneses, I don't know. What do you think, Aussie? Like, if you were there, would you feel exhausted just thinking about trying to hit all the satellite events and all the events events? How would you feel? Oh, do you think? God, I think I'd be exhausted. I'm, I'm, I'm already, I'm already thinking about the fact that we're going to be there for two days, and we're all exhausted already. Just thinking, yeah, yeah. I, I'm like, I'm already tired. Like thinking about it, I've been like planning how I'm getting down there, planning, trying to figure out with you where we're going. I'm yeah. like. Oh Lord, this is gonna be <laughs> this is gonna be wild. <laughs> but if anyone could uh, could swing like that, it's Jared. I mean, he's got he's got that young blood energy. He's not in a deeply committed relationship, so he's got no like people to call. He's got a good job, a W two a uh, uh, Web two job. He's got W two W two W two, and so he's got a lot of projects. So, but he has that flexibility. And I just I think about my Web two job, and I'm like. I ha like I'm looking at my inbox pile up today, you know, and I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm grateful for the time will be there, but it does seem overwhelming. But we're manning the ship, folks. And today, Aussie and I uh, and Aussie, really, because I'm just the guy asking questions because I haven't paid attention to these two major topics. Um, but the one you stumbled in on us talking about was the block space wars. Now, we're going to talk about Ethereum Shanghai. Absolutely. But. Aussie, I want you to continue with this thought. For those piping in, Aussie was just saying that Russia, it just hit one third of the same uh, megawatt usage that the uh, America uses mining Bitcoin, but the projects coming online now are state sponsored so that those might accelerate and maybe even surpass us. But you said before this, and I, want, I do want to dive into this, the block space wars is a hypothesis about the fact that the blockchain is immutable there could be future wars about data on the blockchain? Yeah, they think um, a U.S. Space Force major uh, has basically theorized and speculated that there will be battles for block space and the ability to put things on the Bitcoin blockchain and other blockchains. And Interesting. Wait, wait, let me, and let me catch that. It's, they're not fighting over data that's on the blockchain. In this hypothesis by the Space Force major, he's hypothesized, he or she is hypothesizing that a block might get mined and the, the space to put information on there will be fought. Like just the, just the of space available is the war that they're going to fight over. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna fight for the hash rate so that they can make sure that their data gets there and becomes on the blockchain. So there, there's like... What? Yeah, the, the, this is a huge theory that uh, that they published there at MIT. Um, this this major, he's uh, Jason oh. Lowry. He's he's at uh, MIT, and in his four hundred page dissertation, four hundred page dissertation, is arguing that there will be competition for not only data, but the block rewards. So battling for both of them. Oh, so as... they're bad. So they'll be battling for for the reward of minting a block, especially as we surpass the million dollar mark and beyond. So you think they might throw some, uh, you know, incursion into Europe or into Alaska and that cause a war because like they're directly, like how do you fight over that? Like what is, what is the projected way that he's proposing? Like, will it be a digital for, fight like hackers or will it be a physical war? I feel like it'll be a digital fight from from my understanding is that essentially it's being able to project power by how much Bitcoin rewards you're mining and by how you're getting your data and your um your information 
permanently immutably stored on the blockchain. Because in some ways he, you know, the, what do they say about war? The winner writes the history of the war. And in this case, if, if blockchain is immutable and it becomes one of the few immutable, actually immutable ledgers of history of what went on, I could imagine state actors wanting their side of the story absolutely written, if you will, into the blockchain. So yeah, I could have speculated. I could imagine, you know, like they know where our power grid is. So power grid attacks so that, and then actually trying to, you know, decide when and where a, or when a block might be mined and then causing power outages right at that time so that you're the only player during that mining period. So there's gotta be like a whole group of a analytics scientists. So this was not the Space Force. This was a major in the United States Space Force as their PhD paper. Yeah, as their PhD paper. And they are, from my understanding, one of the lead or if not the lead on cryptocurrency within the Space Force. This is nuts. Now, Tristan, real quick, starting my chain domination today, does that mean you're buying like a heavy gauge gold necklace? Like, what are we talking about, Tristan? Are, are you starting a blockchain? Do you have a funded project in that domain? Or do we need to talk about funding our own blockchain real quick if we were to start our own side chain or parachain aussie what yeah. would you what would you start a parachain on that you would I, hope I, the world would adopt as some oracle of a certain amount of information I, i'd build it on ETH, and i'd build it around i think real estate and deeds mm. I, I think i I, th I agree with you there i think that's pro like the use case there deeds and titles worldwide are a huge issue if we think about the developing world yeah on how basically people can have their title and their their basically their ancestral lands or their yeah. familial lands just ripped out from under them because they don't have a good title system just contested this is a brilliant point now you and i talk a lot about real estate and nfts and or, or a bit and we speculate a lot. And most people are discussing NFTs around real estate from the idea of fractionalization or funding. But this idea of deeds, have you heard of anyone actually trying to work on the deed chain? No one has, at least not for, um, for real estate. The DMV in California is doing car titles, but only as a backup system to their existing database. So and what chain that's all on Ethereum? Tezos. They're working it on, on Tezos. So interesting choice. Yeah, it's a very interesting choice. I, I don't I don't know how they ended up there, but very, yeah. very interesting choice. Yeah. But but they're not they're not really going to the extent that I think you can go with yeah. with deeds, and they're not really ex exploring the full use case. Imagine being able to sell your, I could buy my house, a house from you, Grant, without ever needing a real estate agent, without needing to go see a lawyer, without needing anything, because on chain, I can, we can basically queue up a transaction. Your deed to the house is an NFT. Yeah. I make an offer on chain for your house. Yeah. And we just, the transfer is done on chain. I send you the 400, 500,000 to buy that house from you. Yeah. And I just immediately get the title transferred to me as that amount is transferred to your wallet. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, in the world of blockchains, as we talk about an idea like this, you, one must venture a guess. Do I build... You know, like if I'm going to make a pitch to an investor, do I a pitch? I'm building the home ownership title deed comprehensive, you know, Polkadot, which is like a, a, its own macro chain. And then in the world of Polkadot, there's all these side chains. And so like, or do I just work on an individual chain and try to build in the hooks so that eventually when, say, for example, the repair home repair chain gets built like right now we'll just carry that metadata but what if someone comes along and says okay well i finally have built and invested in the architecture for repair chain um 
we can just hook in. It, because when I think about titles and deeds, there's financing. So like, like the idea of building in the financing and the verification of funds right now, get this. Right now, we're, we've got an offer on a Cocoa property. And I didn't even update you with the, this Aussie, but um, we got a pre-approved. Our financing is fine. We have renters. We have rental incomes on properties. We heard back yesterday and the underwriter said, hey, because of the FHA loan, this type of loan you're using, which is basically the Federal Housing Authority, you get a lower discounted deposit, 3.5%. Well, the, there's a crazy 100-mile rule that if you're moving less than 100 miles away, which is bizarre, you cannot use the rental income from the property you're leaving. Bizarro rule to qualify. And so, you know, we have a significant part of our represented debt to income ratio is rental income. And, but if you move more than 100 miles, theoretically, like you're fine. It, it's fine. Like I would have thought the opposite because like maybe they don't count that these rents will follow me into the new property. I don't even understand it entirely. But my point is it's a super nuanced rule. In the world of smart contracts, when someone builds the financing chain, and financing, like a like it would have to be so specific as to be the pre-approval chain. All of these are then dependent on ZK proofs. So like an identity chain. So or whether we're talking about social security, so you, there's all these side chains. I don't know how a title could transfer without these other, like can you build a chain without these other components? I don't know if that's even possible. I don't, I mean, you could because you could, like, you could basically say that proof of funds and everything, everything is approved. You, the funds are on chain, and then you just do the transfer on chain. The tra only the transfer itself self is done on chain. And so proof of f funds, proof of reserves, everything else is, you could start off normally. chain. Yeah, it could be, it could start off chain, could start normally. Because you have to file the the deed or the title at the county records office or in your case, the municipality or something. And so, yeah, there's a lot of off-chain stuff that has to happen, but I guess you could lay the groundwork because if someone tried to back out or someone tried to cr cry foul, you do have the, the blockchain ledger to point to the transaction details and say, no, they double sign this. They've, and maybe you don't even bother with verification of funds except the deposit. Did the deposit get transferred? You could write the smart contract so you don't even have an escrow. You, you write the smart contract so that it's just committed. But then they, that's a great, see, this is a great example of some of the challenges why people aren't tackling this. In, a, in an off-chain, in a Web2 transaction, it goes into an escrow. And that escrow, <laughs> uh, that escrow is only released by a title company when they show that this person's legit and set, this person's legit and set, boom, let's release the funds. We know that that systematically can be automated but the build out of that is nuts it would so it would be there is quite a build up to make it happen but we could start your like we could start in my county and basically go through all the deeds in my county work with the the local county all the deeds everything from the deed for, from the county database is uploaded to the chain and you get basically set up the deeds and set it up for that one county. Mm, yeah. No, and then you, you could, do county to county and you yeah. just slowly build it out. You could do that. Tristan says, would that contradict monopoly rules though, if there's only one chain for that specific area of business? And Tristan makes a great point. And his point though can probably help us understand blockchains a bit better. We could, so Tristan, in this case, when we talk about a main chain and a side chain, the comparison being like Polkadot and Polkadot side chains. Polkadot actually, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Aussie. I, 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 I don't know the nuances of this mechanism, but Polkadot only has a limited number of slots for its side chains. I think it's like nine or 11 slots or something to that 16. effect. 16, I think 16. Okay, it could be 16. And they auction them off, if I'm not mistaken. So they themselves, Polkadot themselves, are not the owners of the side chains. And the side chains could have multiple functions, right? But all that Polkadot owns is the underlying architecture. 
And so you're probably right. Like if you owned all of the chains, um, that's one thing. But one thing you could do is you could say, what is core to a real estate transaction? Is it the, the transfer of title? Is it the deed? Is it the contract making? The proposal? You could actually say, what is the backbone of an actual real estate transaction and build the core, the spine, if you will, of that as the central main chain. And then from there, maybe even auction off yourself or partner with people to build the side chains. For example, what also you're talking about is title or deed registering at the county level. Well, there's like a municipal title chain that would have to be built just for that. It, yeah. It has very specific needs. Uh, needs and requirements. Yeah. And then someone's got to scan it and, and make that worth value. And so what would the value be? It'd be a speed of contract. Um, so you'd have to look at the value proposition and kind of triangulate, well, what is the spinal column of a real estate transact? Maybe it's just funding. I don't know. But well, I think there's a million things. And I think one way that you can't, uh, you basically take out monopoly rules with the, with the one chain is like for, you could have a, main financing chain which is the architecture for all all chains for for all financing chains there could be the bank of america financing chain there could be the jp morgan financing chain and so within the architecture each sub bank or each offering for financing for example could have their own side chain with their own slight different quirks and their own different slightly different requirements that are built all within the data feed for. You know uh, what this keeps coming back to for me? The center of all these chains is identity. Because you mentioned the example of the Bank of America chain. And it's like, man, like that boils down to identity, which then backs into zero knowledge proofs. And so I don't know much about the soul token that Zuck was, was it Zuck that was talking about the soul token? No, no, Vitalik was talking about the soul token. Um, basically, your Ethereum address that travels with you everywhere and is kind of the, the, the main pillar of zero knowledge proofs. Because I like the behavior of blockchains. Like, I like that I can selectively choose anonym anonymity. Like, when we talk about our real estate chain, we should be able to flick a switch and go, mm, I'd like this deal to be uh, anonymous, but my address be on there, you know? Um, but then I think about all the types of hooks that have to exist. And I wonder if Cardano isn't already built out for uh, uh, on-chain for this sort of use case, because they have invested so much in identification hooks, financing hooks, research hooks like how do i crawl this thing um i wonder how that looks do you know anything about cardano's chain i don't know enough about cardano's chain that that is probably the chain i know the least well of the majors if we talk evms i know enough about most the evms if you talk polygon matic and yeah. ethereum i know a decent amount about solano yeah cardano if we talk about 10 of those main this is probably the one i know the least about yeah uh, it, yeah, it's, the, it's the standard meme, and I don't. I haven't dived deep enough into it to to understand <laughs> why it maybe isn't actually a meme. Yeah, man. So okay, so let's get back to some block space wars real quick. So this guy wrote a thesis. Does he believe in the thesis, or is this a hypothetical war games sort of? What is your impression of how people are responding to it? Is it more just a hypothesis that's interesting or is it like a viable possibility i think it's a viable possibility because i think he believes in this he believes in the need to mine bitcoin as a strategic imperative for the u.s interesting he in one of his tweets as a war tactical advantage yeah a geopolitical to, to maintain to or else it risks losing its lead as a global superpower in the 21st century which is already happening with the de-dollarization yeah Interesting. exactly he one of his tweets says our first amendment rights to free speech will not protect you from government regulators who are actively maneuvering to ban 
Bitcoin under the argument that it represents a threat to national security. Your best bet is to argue that it is it would be a national strategic security hazard to ban Bitcoin, and it would be against the Second Amendment, not just the first, to ban Bitcoin. It is an undefeatable argument in in his in his eyes. Interesting. Yeah, so that would be that would be something to hear regulators about face from a national security global power position because and and you know what's interesting even if they don't want to believe that the great agitator Russia is is has some advantage like what if we just want to start doing business in Russian uh, rubles or Bitcoin, because literally because of Bitcoin liquidity. And what was the uh, what was the was it OPEC that uh, agreed to start doing business in the Chinese yuan? What what or then there's a whole bunch of them. Saudi Arabia, um, I think Malaysia just took a huge investment from China, and part of the deal has to do with um, has to do with basically keeping money under uh, doing some of the deals on in yuan. Um, interesting. Indonesia has talked about it. Um, like there's, there's a good dozen plus countries. Russia now does more deals in Juan than they do in U.S. dollar now. Oh, I bet. I bet Brazil. Tristan says Brazil. Brazil. Yeah, Brazil is one of them. I, I knew there was a South American, yeah. and I couldn't remember if it was in the Brazil Chinese Juan. That India is... is another one. Really? Yeah. And do we have like infographics or like visual capitalist? I love that website, visual capitalist, uh, capitalist. Do we have visual graphics somewhere that are starting to show the percentage? Because these headlines sound great, but if it's like, oh, no, they just started doing a little bit, but they're still doing, you know, 85% of their transactions in U.S. dollars. Um, or is it significant? Like, is it really hitting hard? I can see your fingertips going. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I'm trying to see because I know. So I, I know that a statistic that's being thrown around is in the 1990s, about 80% of global transactions were done in U.S. dollars. Yeah. We are now just under 60% of global trade transactions are now being done in U.S. dollars. And, okay, th that's not a little bit. No. That's, that's pretty significant. And then, like, I wonder... How much of global transactions now is is crypto, not just Bitcoin, is crypto representing? I mean, it's got to, I mean, is it even a point? I don't think so. I, I'd be surprised if it's a point at this point. Um, unless, uh, unless that's the route that um, European countries took to buy Russian oil. Um, oh. That's, that's the, because they were accepting um, they were accepting Bitcoin for their oil. So I don't know whether or not that that would have caused a significant uptick in terms of dollar volume in uh, in Bitcoin. So from Swift banking system, uh, I've got, okay, I'm going to actually just share my screen on this. This will be interesting. So let's see here, share screen. Uh, I'm going to go here to, there we go. Got it. So we've got this screen right here. Boom. This is from Statista and this stat is from, uh, Swift banking actually. And you're, you're right. As of January, 2023, the U S dollar from Swift banking. Now, Swift banking by nature, excludes any crypto, right? And Swift banking could also be tilted because uh, who's govern? What are the governance mechanisms? What are the governing countries of of that? But the U.S. dollar only represents forty five percent. The euro thirty three percent. Now I'm surprised by this. China still only represents one point three three percent, and that's this is just within Swift banking, but. That number has got to be indicative of something. And then the ruble is like a fraction. Uh, it doesn't even appear on this chart. No. Um, the Chinese, according to some other numbers, about 7% of 
of transactions are currently being done in China, Chinese yuan. Um, now, mm. outside of just SWIFT, uh, but it's up two and a half. It's up almost three percent just this last month. What is transaction overall transactions in Chinese yuan? Interesting. Okay. Now, what are the implications of this? Like, I know that we're here to talk about crypto. What are the implications of this from an economy standpoint of the West? What does this mean? Well, for the U.S. in general, it means the doll, they're going to have to actually start paying their debts because they can't, if you can't keep, if you're not the global reserve currency. Yeah. And you can't basically print money to bury your debts, to pay your debts, because uh. <laughs> people aren't taking your money, using your money for trade, and you're not getting fees from people using your money for trade. Essentially, your money starts losing value. You start becoming the strongest dollar, and whatever is replacing it is what's going to take that share. And so you're going to be losing purchasing power you're going to lose the power to basically continue to print dollars and and make money as much basically print money in thin air because people don't want your dollars anymore it's why we get runaway inflation in so many you know less uh like third world countries essentially because people aren't doing trade in their dollar and so their government is printing their dollars to pay their debts so, and, and the reason we're on this, folks, for those who are just piping in, is what we're actually talking about is block space wars and how uh, there could be future wars over recording history. Um, and, but really how we're here is that in this manuscript, he calls for this being a national security issue. And if we're already losing purchasing power you would think that if this were a, like if this gets floated to the National Security Council in the United States as a legit possibility, you might have pressure from the legislative bodies uh, and the, and honestly the, from the military itself from from the military from the Security Council, yeah, to say, hey, listen, these regulators need to quit pushing against crypto so hard because we're already being de-dollarized. And that's just happening because of economics and inflation. Now, what we're doing is, is they're competing on velocity of funds. You know, if I can do liquid crypto from the euro to Bitcoin to the ruble, then that's nuts. Now, how does Fed now play into this? Does Fed now compete with this? Fed now is, I don't think it competes with it. I think Fed now is some attempt basically a stepping stone to show that they've got the capacity to handle cbdc fed now is not some people are saying fed now is essentially a cbdc uh fed now to me is just a step towards a cbdc but that doesn't really protect your velocity of money doesn't encourage people to transact in your dollars because if you're still devaluing your currency through printing and mm. then there's no there's no interest in in continuing, even if it's moving as fast as crypto, doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna solve the problem of the devaluing of the dollar. So what we're saying right now is still the largest culprit is inflation, is if I'm hearing you correctly. The largest culprit is still inflation and a devalued dollar. So like this is the argument. Big Daddy Jay Powell says when he raises our interest rates. So do you expect another point or so? I'm expecting at least another quarter basis point. So I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm thinking this in 20 some odd days, we're going to see another interest rate hike. I, it's not just inflation. I think this is really important. So it's also the total supply of U.S. dollars. Yes. So when they bailed out the banks or they Bail, they didn't bail out the banks, but they bailed out the banks. Yeah, yeah. Um, after SVB, they printed a bunch of dollars. And so by printing those dollars, you're, you're making every other dollar that in existence less value. Yeah. Um, and if 
So yeah, I, I totally expect another rate hike in May. And mar- the market isn't believing Jay Powell in when they say that he's that interest rates are going to stay stable or continue increasing or at least staying stable through the end of the year. People are still expecting him to pull back. In December of this year, right now, CME futures are predicting with over 50, over 70%, or 80% are saying that interest rates will be lower in December of this year than they are currently. Now, that's interesting. That's interesting. There's no way. 80%. So... 80% 80% of who again? Of um, basically economists, um, market, uh, basically people that are betting, like basically people that are putting options and futures on where the interest rate will be are saying it's going to be below, it's going to be below current rates by December. Um, it basically is, there's interest rate traders. They just like there's option traders on yeah. food and everything else. Eighty percent of them are saying it's going to be below current rates right now. I mean, they would have to not raise in the next session and then progressively raise. I mean, I that's tough to imagine. I mean, it's only six. I don't know. It's only six months away, but or I know that. Yeah, it's six. Well, six months, six meetings. It's six meetings away. Yeah. So, okay, so what's Tristan getting at here? Inversely, though, global deficits in the dollar prevent that, though, correct? Unless you're talking about global default. Prevent what exactly? Do you kind of understand what Tristan is saying? What he's referring to? I'm saying global deficits, but global deficits, yes, lead to printing dollars. um, And, but everyone, so everyone prints dollars to, and yes, there, a lot of deals are being done in US dollars, but if they move to paying defaults in wands, then it doesn't, doesn't necessarily prevent what you're talking about. Um, it you could have. I don't think you'd have a global default. You would have because the U.S. dollar would become so devalued. It'd be a U.S. default. Um, if everyone starts doing trade in yuan or the euro or anything else, then the the default will only be the U.S. is the only one that's going to default on their debt because other people will be using other currencies to pay their debt, which will be holding your value. Interesting. And I mean, wouldn't it, you would think that the logic and rationale between something, but behind something like Bitcoin would make even governments go, listen, no one can mess with this value except market makers, like people sitting on the largest chunks of Bitcoin. Like these are the only people that can really affect this market. So maybe the race that you're, your shift from world reserve currency in totality. Oh, okay. Inversely, though, global deficits in the dollar prevent the shift from world reserve currency in totality from USD to yuan, unless you're talking about a global default. That's interesting. So, Aussie, what you're saying in response to Tristan uh, here is that they still could could pay back their potential defaults in Chinese yuan and it make them flush from their debts, but then continue the de-dollarization of the United States. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm saying yes. Even if your debt is in USD, you can do trade in yuan and then pay down your USD. And because USD will be losing value, you'll actually be protecting your ability to pay down that debt. Um, yeah, and it snowballs because if they're doing trade in the yuan, there's lower you know, use and value and purchasing power for the US dollar in theory. And so you've done your trade in, in Juan, your debts come due, you pay down. Well, you said I owed, you know, a billion plus interest and now your purchasing power is entirely lower. So that's no problem. But existing debts in the USD would require the US to accept that as a new currency to pay current existing debts in the no. US. So that's, so what's yes, he get? Well, first accept- off, First off, could you explain to the layperson how you interpret this question? So basically, he's saying, you know, most global debts at the moment between countries are held in U.S. dollars. And that's part of how the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency. And in order for countries to pay their debts to the U.S., which 
there's a lot of countries that are in debt in the U.S. in U.S. dollars. They would have to, the U.S. would have to accept whatever currency they're willing to make that payment in. What I am arguing, and so in order to pay the debt, otherwise, if the U.S. wouldn't accept the yuan, for example, as the new as new currency to pay the debt, it would cause global default because no one would pay, be able to pay their loans because they wouldn't be using the U.S. dollar. That, what, well, go ahead, go ahead. What I'm arguing is that you can do trade in other dollars and then just because the U.S. dollar is losing value, you just convert that other currency into U.S. dollars and then pay your debt. And so the U.S. wouldn't have to be accepting a new, another currency to, to pay down for those debts. But it, instead, it would just be Hey, we're doing. We'll transfer some of our, our, our from our new currency to U.S. dollars to just pay our debts, and that's the only yeah. way that we'll do our trade. That's Which, the only way we that use new our currency. US dollar. Well, yeah. So why those borrowed USD funds got converted to yuan in this example? The yuan is growing in purchasing power. So not only are they doing trade, hopefully increasing the amount they have, it's also gaining against its spread against the U.S. dollar. And so there's like, it's like extra interest. It's like the inverse of inflation. Uh, it's deflationary, right? And so meanwhile, there's an acceleration between the value, the purchasing power of the two. And so then you liquidate your one to pay off your right. We do have to, you know, these large debts do have to get paid off in USD, but you just convert last minute and send it off to them. And when you convert last minute, you've gained so much. It's kind of, I picture this kind of like what happened with SBV, SVB. When the Y Combinator people are like, I've got 10 million that's about to get liquidated. I don't want to move it to another bank, so I'm going to move it into Bitcoin. Bitcoin hyped from 16 or 17,000 to 28,000. We all know this. And now they're like, wait, why would I convert it all back to US dollars except my debts? So a lot of it, a lot of capital, not all, but a lot of this capital is staying as Bitcoin. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to bring this up because um, because if we didn't mention this, we'd be out of our mind that right now, boom, we're looking, we're 30, looking 000. at, a, we're, we're at 30,000. This is 30,100. Just a moment ago is at 30,400. You break 30,500. You've got momentum against a resistance line right to 31,000. And in the last seven days, that's a seven day bump. We know that this can, this is volatile. This can tank just as quickly. But for now, it seems like I think, well, and let's venture this guess. My guess is that there's still so much liquidity that stayed, that stay, uh, that capital and liquidity stayed in cryptocurrency. So it didn't bottom out. That built some trust and now it's seeing new inflows. But I'm not sure. Aussie, why do you think we're seeing these numbers uh, in crypto right now? Because people don't believe the Fed. You think it's you think it's that simple? Well, I I mean, I, I let me look at the stock market. I haven't looked at the stock market today, but I'm sure. assuming the stock market is is up as well. Um, oh, okay. So, okay. But let me look at the oh Nasdaq 100. Let's go look at Nasdaq 100. Okay, the Nasdaq 100 is down today. I I will, I I will plead. Okay, I was gonna say one one big thing is. Partially, it's fun money. <laughs> that's that's part of my reasoning. Okay. Is, um, Bitcoin's a risk on asset. Some people have just become fatigued with bad news, and so yeah. they're not reacting to bad news, and they're not. Um, they're they're not having. It. Yeah, a big bad news event aren't having as huge an impact, and it's the same thing with big positive events, though. Um, like MicroStrategy bought a bunch more Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Normally, that causes a pump in the market. No one's batted an eye at the fact that MicroStrategy has bought more Bitcoin. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So, so that's it. Now, we got jobs numbers last Friday when everyone was, when the markets were closed. How were the jobs numbers? Do you recall? They were, so they were good in some ways. They were bad in others, like depending on who you're, who you are. Yeah. Um, job openings are down overall. Interesting. So that is good. 
for the Fed, that means we're on the right track. Lower job openings means there's less jobs for people unemployed, which means the chances for a wage inflation spiral to occur decreases. They've already said that they don't really think that that's a a huge risk at this point in time, but they want to see the number of openings go down as an incentive of showing, hey, the market is slowing down. There's less fall, like velocity of the dollar. The dollar is not, um, like we're not spending more. We're not, growth is slowing down a bit. Yeah. Growth. And so that, that's kind of been a sign that they're looking for. The thing is, is hires, quits, and transfers have stayed about the same. And mm-hmm. so it means that people are still able to either quit their job, transfer, or and get hired within the U.S. Interesting. At the same level. So the, the, the ability to move between jobs is still rather high and rather huh. easy. And so if you're looking at it from a standard American perspective, oh, there's less jobs available, there's less job openings, people, the economy's not doing so well, it's harder to find a job. Yeah. But when we look at, and for the Fed, and for people that are looking at this other data about transfers and hires, really, hey, people are moving around just as well. Job openings are down, which is great, but we're still, there's still strength we're seeing the weakening in the job market but the labor market isn't really that weak and so they're interesting it, it kind of incentivized uh yeah we can do another rate hike job market isn't tanking that hard yeah interesting that that is interesting and i guess we're i mean we we always get into some of this when it's just you and i because you know you got your pulse on what's going on economically but this, this there really is a serious I could see how the United States Security and um, uh, Department of Homeland Security, the Security Council, could really think it's a major problem that our dollar is being removed from so many countries, and then therefore tying that together with these block space wars. It's like if that becomes real pressure to the Fed, if that becomes real pressure to regulators they might just let off of cryptocurrency and let development happen. And maybe maybe that will cause them to um, embrace a CBDC. Maybe it will cause them to maybe just not push so many lawsuits against uh, cryptocurrency at large, except true bad actors. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it would be quite interesting. But if I may, with the remaining time, let's talk a little bit about the Ethereum hard fork. So this is known as Shanghai. It's a hard fork. Now, real quick, to your knowledge, when we have a hard fork like this, as I understand it, the code splits, and this is where we got Ethereum Classic. Is this such a hard fork that there will still be passionate people who don't make the transition to the Shanghai hard fork? No, no one's not making the transition to the Shanghai hard fork. Why unless, is that? Unless, they're, unless they don't want money, essentially. <laughs> Uh, essentially, if they don't value money, yeah, either in the form of cryptocurrency, in the form of Ethereum, uh, then they're not going to move on to this hard fork. This hard fork is essentially the pinnacle of ending uh, of the transition to proof of stake because now people. This can, is the. This is the end. This is like the the big kind of final closing that really makes becoming a proof of stake validator on Ethereum interesting and valuable. So up until this point, you could not withdraw your ETH that you stayed. So that 32 ETH, which is now almost 64,000 US dollars. Yeah. You could not withdraw it. It was permanently stuck there. Some of it's been permanently stuck there for over two years. And interesting. At, even to a certain point, rewards, block rewards that you were getting from transaction fees from being a validator were law. Okay. So you, that 4.2-ish percent that you were getting a year on your $64,000, you couldn't claim it. You couldn't access it. And therefore, there was a certain disincentive to become a validator 
and provide greater security to Ethereum. Now, that mechanism, though, was intentional because they wanted people who were going to stake their 32 Ethereum uh, to be a node validator. They wanted them to be serious and they wanted them to be around for the long haul. So this wasn't a bug or a miss. This was part of the plan. So if you got in, it, it, I, I can imagine the incentives did defer uh, uh, or did dissuade some people to not become a validator. They didn't want their 32 ETH to get locked up. But didn't that create stability in the network? It creates some stability. It also created, like, I could definitely see if that ETH, because it was about, right at the moment, it's about 15% of the circulating supply or 15% of the total supply of Ethereum right now uh, is locked up. You know, we, you could have seen greater drops from, if we think back to FTX or any of those big events, you could have seen a greater drop in, in total um, ETH price just because there was greater liquidity. There was more ETH out. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, but at the same time, I believe uh, with this, it's still a three-month lockup. So even oh. like you're, you're still committing for 90 days, but sure. you, after those 90 days, then you're free to withdraw at any time. And so it provides- You lose your that, status as a validator though. You lose your status as a validator. Yeah. So it's kind of a middle ground of, yes, you're forcing people to commit and you're adding stability to the network, but you're also, you're also providing that incentive and that liquidity for people who do want to val want to become validators, but yeah. maybe maybe that sixty four thousand you're you're a real crypto maxi, and that sixty four thousand dollars in e is, is like your emergency fund. It's like your emergency emergency fund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, <laughs> you know, there there's there's that chance, there's that off chance that you know you're. I don't know, your house catches fire. And so you need that, you might need that money to, to buy yourself a clothes and get yourself somewhere to stay until insurance uh, mm. comes. And so, you know, having that extra, having that ability to withdraw it does provide um, a potential incentive for people to, to stake. So it's, it's estimated to be around 18 million ETH that is now available. Why are folks afraid of this upgrade? They're afraid of this upgrade because they think that it's going to lead to a huge jump on the jump. They, they, a dump. A dump. dump. A huge amount of that E. They, they believe, for whatever reason, that all of that, all of that or a portion of that ETH is going to end up on the market and sold from people that were holding it and had staked it. Interesting. And and we talked about this for those who don't know, like I have my Ethereum on my Ledger Nano and I have it staked through Lido staking through the Ledger Nano. And Aussie and the guys uh, reminded me a few weeks ago because I said I haven't gotten any rewards. I haven't gotten a notification about rewards. And the idea is, is well, because you're staked, bro, and you can't until after Shanghai. And so like ha ha because it's the blockchain, have my rewards been calculated? And so I'll get a certain amount of staked rewards. I just haven't, it just hasn't been distributed to me yet. Is yeah. that kind of what we're talking about? Well, that's it. We're waiting till tomorrow. Tomorrow it'll start getting distributed. And so uh, it should start being, once the hard fork goes through, it should be able to start being distributed. It'll probably, for those kind of platforms, it'll probably take a week or so for them to calculate exactly who's owed what and yeah, uh, where it all goes. But yeah. That's, What's that's your sentiment? Do you sentiment. think it's going to cause a dump in the market yourself? No. Why not? There's anyone who was willing to state yeah. for for the two years that that since staking is opened up, aren't just going to suddenly dump ETH on the market. Be some of that ETH was probably staked at four thousand dollars, so they're probably sitting at a fifty percent loss. So they're uh -huh. not going to dump. They're not going to dump their ETH. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other big factor is about 60%, at least 60% of that ETH is staked through services like Lido. Got it. So really, those people, if you, because I think your ETH is probably an ST ETH. Yes. Uh, yes. So 
you could technically sell that STE on the market. It probably had a discount. It was probably selling at a discount or discounted rate, but you could sell that for ETH at any given time. Sure. And so any retail investor who was staking through these, in, these investments, through these different services, had that liquidity if they needed it. Um, Interesting. So even if it was at a mild discount. So it's the it's the validators themselves that really felt stuck, but anyone that might have been staking in general could have technically swapped out ST ETH for some ETH. The ST ETH is still staked. It hasn't moved, but it's swapped with someone else who's willing to hold that. Uh, that's interesting. Okay, so so is this it for the Shanghai hard fork? Is this the major highlights, or are there any other changes they're, going on with the hard fork? They're working on the API. They're doing some API work that I don't understand well enough to bring some of that um, that zero knowledge ETH, though those permanent addresses. They're working towards that, and they're working towards um, the sharding. So it's there, there's moves that are happening on the chain that are also kind of enabling future hard forks. Um, most principally the one around, um, sh uh, around sharding, which will help reduce gas fees overall. So after tomorrow, we should see a progressive reduction in gas fees? Not tomorrow. Tomorrow is just enabling the potential, that the next upgrade that will lead to the reduction in gas fees. So this isn't going to affect gas fee prices at all yet. It's okay. just building to that. Interesting. Interesting. Now, real quick, just because I cannot let this go, I, yeah. because it's so science fiction, I have to hear this. The block space wars. Did this guy give a timeline on when the 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 demand for space on a block is so high that they'd be willing to hack and go to war over? Not that I've found. Um, he, he does talk about Who a piece is this in the guy? 21st century. Um, What's his name? Major Jason Lowry. He's published, his dissertation is being published as a book um, called Soft War, a novel theory on power projection and the national strategic significance of Bitcoin. Um, so not Jason P. Lowry. No, Jason Lowry, Major Jason Lowry. So um, it's supposed to come out later this year. I don't know exactly when, but. Dude, I'm going to start following this guy. Major Jason Lowry. Come on. Where's this guy? There he is. I'll have to find. I, I uh, oh, it's it is Jason P. Lowry. Yeah, that's who it is. The software. Yeah, that's who it is. I'm already following this guy. No, oh, yeah, you didn't oh, yeah, see did. his tweets. <laughs> well, I didn't have his his notifications turned on. So, a, a novel theory on power projection and the national strategic significance of Bitcoin. That is just nuts. I want to buy. I'm going to buy this guy's book. This is crazy. Now, so you do you buy into it's kind of like you know? Do you think Ethereum hard fork is going to see a major liquidation? Do you think that this will come to fruition? Do you think wages wars will be waged over block space? I feel like there is a reasonable chance that there will be battle for block chase, block space, and blockchain rewards. I mean, I'm thinking about Bitcoin and. Imagine being able to back your dollar at least partially with Bitcoin. And that at the national level, you mean? At the national level, you were backing the dollar at least partially with Bitcoin. Okay. So you're maybe backing it with Bitcoin, gold, and other things. And so your dollar now has something that is actually promoting and gaining value and maintaining value. And so being able, just like gold or even better than gold, there's a finite supply and it doesn't depend on where your resources are. Like, do you have gold deposits in the U S or in China or wherever it's dependent on your block, your, your mining power. 
your ability to mine those rewards to back your and, dollar. And let me ask you this, like, I think uh, we'll be mining Bitcoin until like for 150 years. Like, I think the date goes out a, bit, a little bit. What happens when the last block is mined? What happens to the value of Bitcoin then? I feel like at that point, it could continue to grow exponentially. But how are transactions recorded at that point? That's, that's a question I know. I think that's the big thing. That, I think the chain still exists. But the chain you've exists, gotta... but the immutability, if we trade Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the blockchain on which that ledger is written, but there's no new blocks to be mined. There's no new rewards to be mined. That's the difference. There's no new, the blocks can still exist. There's no block rewards. And so finding a reason or a way to incentivize block Bitcoin miners to continue mining in the future is the biggest question. I think that's troubled the Bitcoin community for the next, until blockchain rewards disappear. You should be finding a way, building up an emergency fund of sorts to essentially incentivize miners to keep mining after rewards disappear. Well, and the interesting thing is that like computational power at that point should be so ridiculously fast that maybe it won't matter. Maybe, uh, you know, you, you and I won't have to be running large Bitcoin mining farms anymore because computational power, GPU power, I mean, it's just going, I, I can't even fathom it, right? Um, and so a new block computationally, and I wonder even if there are no rewards then, if the algorithm changes and resets to not be as difficult. Because it, all we need is a hash for the subsequent block, but we don't, we're not rewarding anyone for proof of work at that point. That, that's interesting. I'll have to dive into that a little bit and see like how this will work once we've mined the last Bitcoin and what some of the speculators are talking about. Because it's pr it, if, if Bitcoin is as immutable and fixed as it says, that means we can build up a lot of assumptions. If we can build up a lot of assumptions, when those assumptions can no longer be supported and that thing collapses, we can almost predict major shifts that go on once the last block is mined. And a lot more money will be made in that shift too. So that's quite interesting. All right, shout outs. What's your shout outs today, Aussie? Ah, oh, I mean, Tristan, thanks for those awesome questions. That yeah. was like, that definitely like is amazing. So big shout out to you. And I mean, big shout out to anyone who's going to be joining us at NFT NYC uh, in yeah. a couple of days. Like huge shout out to you guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I would give a shout out to Jared. He's not here. He's already in New York. Shout out to those, uh, as we've said, who have committed to uh, visiting with us and doing our little meet and greet. We're super excited just to like meet everybody IRL. Uh, no big pressure there, but we just want to connect with everybody. Uh, Jackie Roach, George Totorolo, and maybe I'll actually learn how to say George's last name correctly. Uh, <laughs> my last name is Nadu. So it's N-I-E-D-D-U, so I just go by Grant Sparks, right? Like, it's super easy to know because I've got an Italian last name too, so I empathize. Um, and then we had a handful of other folks who said they were stopping by. NLC said she was stopping by, I think. Um, uh, Hemily. Uh, but who else was on the list that said they were definitely coming by? Uh, Victor said he might. Not sure, but shout out to all you lovely faces. We hope that you have a great time this week. We hope you don't get sucked into the hype either because we do have to remember it's not about the hype, it's about building. And we really need to build. I'm excited with the things we're building together, Aussie. Like, we got to move on this stuff. And uh, we'll probably leak a little bit, like maybe even against Jared's will, we'll on Friday. <laughs> uh, we won't help. You can't help but talk about the stuff you're excited about with your people. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably share with that at Connolly's in New York City. But aside from that, everybody, thanks for stopping by. This is Aussie with Decentralized News. I'm Grant with State of Spark and Not Crypto Bros. And we'll catch you next week. Take care. Take care.